Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Chicago jazz double bassist, composer, and arranger Joe Palacastro. He grew up in the fertile jazz, classic, and popular music scene of Cincinnati, Ohio, and studied classical double bass performance on a full scholarship at Miami University. These days, he leads his own trio, and the group has two albums featuring his writing, arranging, and performing, and they have a great blend of jazz, funk, and many other influences. They were releasing a brand new 2017 CD called Screen Sounds. It's hitting the streets August the 11, 2017, and they are going to hit the road to promote it. That will include a swing through Kansas City's best jazz joint, the Green Lady Lounge at 6 on July 30th, 2017. Go out and catch him. Joe had a lot to say, so dig this interview, my friends. First of all, Joe, thanks for taking a minute out. I know it's impromptu, last minute. I really appreciate you talking to me. No, we're happy to happy to talk to you, and we're really excited about getting down to the Green Lady Lounge and down to Kansas City. Have you been to the Green Lady Lounge? I have never been there before. Um, and it's funny, I was just talking to a, a, a friend of ours that, that was down in Kansas City, and he didn't really, I guess he, he lived there a while ago, and he didn't remember the Green Lady Lounge, so I'm not quite sure how long it's been up and running, but um, yeah, it looks it looks fantastic. John's been great to deal with over there, and I mean, we're really excited to get in there. Yeah, the beautiful thing about the Green Lady is it's consistently getting ranked as one of the top jazz clubs, and not only in the Midwest, but in the country, and when you walk in... It doesn't matter what time of day you walk in, it feels like midnight. It's like a David Lynch dream. You walk in, it's red velvet, <laughs> it's totally hip, it's totally cool, it's like the perfect jazz joint. I guess with that being said, how did all of this come about? Well, this band, uh, I would say, I mean, not to go back too far, though, but I had landed this three-night-a-week gig at this uh, place in downtown Chicago called Pops for Champagne, and it wasn't even originally under my name, and about... Five years ago or so, I took over the gig, and I really looked at it as this opportunity to sort of write and arrange and develop a band sound. The current lineup, which is now, I mean, really the uh, very solidified band, got together uh, roughly three years ago. And from that point forward, you know, we started putting out releases. The first one was just meant to sort of document uh, this this project that we'd been doing of West Side Story. And then this, the, the album that we put out last year was all of our jazz arrangements of pop tunes and also a little nod to Pops for Champagne. And starting last year, you know, we, we've been sort of, we've been traveling a bit more, kind of doing two and three night run outs to different regions. And, and then, you know, with this new record, we really are trying to put together a full national campaign for it. And there's, and that's what we've been doing. So, we're, this is the, that actually is the second stop of about 30 cities that we're doing this fall alone. Um, and we're, you know, we're looking at a West Coast tour and a full East Coast tour in 2018 as well. So I had contacted John just because I saw the club and then we were, we were putting together, we had, um, we're starting that tour in, in Des Moines, uh, this Saturday and about Six months ago, when we were, you know, putting this tour together, I contacted him. You know, I said, I was asking if he had anything open in there, and I will never forget what he said. He goes, I do for the right band. <laughs> I, I sent him some stuff, and he was really responsive, and he, you know, and he, he liked the group a lot, and he said, let's make this happen. That run is about a week long that we're doing. We're doing uh, Des Moines, Kansas City, Minneapolis, and then we have a series of shows up in the Driftless Gap region. Well, and this is all going to be in promotion of your August 11th album, correct? Yeah, screen sounds. Yeah, yeah. It's the the album is a collection of uh, movie and TV music, all sort of reimagined by the band. And uh, the album officially comes out on August the 11th, and that'll be where you know it's released, uh, you know, on Amazon and Apple Music, and you know, through all the retail outlets and stuff. But um, we are going to have all of our um, all of our pre-release copies with us on this tour. So perfect. Well, so the timing is perfect. Talk to me about this album. It sounds like, kind of with my precursor with the Lynchian Red Velvet mode in here, that you're actually going to be preaching to the choir with this album in a joint like the Green Lady. I, that's sort of the hope, you know, with this. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned this in the album liner notes 
and I think that this is something a lot of people share in common. My pathway through to a lot of the music that you know that I loved was through film and television, especially of my generation. You know, I I call myself the cable generation. You know, I'm born in the late '70s, raised on you know raised on cable and TV. And I didn't come from a musical family, so a lot, a lot, you know, my first exposure to jazz and my first exposure to, you know, the the, the pop music that I really, um, you know, hold very dear was all through those outlets. And I think a lot of people share that in common, you know, that, you know, the people who tend to like jazz and stuff also tend to kind of go for certain type of film and certain types of movies and things. And we really enjoy in this group having some sort of touchstone for audiences to, you know, to go along for kind of a crazy ride with us. We've we've found that when people find even just the kernel of something relatable, you can get away with murder in the middle. You know, you can go nearly, nearly go free with it and stuff, but it's just, you know, finding that little, that like I said, that this little touchstone to go forward. So let me ask you this. You're coming to Kansas City. You're going on a big swing here. How's everything in Chicago going these days? Chicago's an f- uh, absolutely incredible city. I mean, that's that's the one thing about it, the city that can be a little bit of a trap, is that there are so many outlets to just play in the city and stay in the city and make a really good living being a jazz musician here. There's not a reason to necessarily take your take a group out, other than that if you really want to share the music with a broader audience, or you want to you know you want to create a, a broader presence for the band. Yeah. The jazz scene here is incredible. I mean, it's, there are I would say at least five or six full time jazz clubs, and then in addition to that, there are all kinds of great rooms that offer music. You know, a few nights a week here and there, and such. So what I want to know next is. How did your sound evolve? You know, there's a lot of people out there that kind of have a straight ahead or kind of a more classroom approach that meets reality. And then there's others out there that are kind of pushing envelopes, maybe say in the same way that an Ornette Coleman or a later career Miles Davis, where they blend in all of these different 21st century influences and kind of make their own thing under the umbrella of jazz, but really adhering to the history of it. So I want to know, how did you all with your different personalities and different philosophies on music come in and create the sound that you have? The number one aspect of that, I think, is just chemistry. So uh, you can put great musical voices together and that it doesn't always work because people just don't have... Uh, there's not enough, you know, I, I always like to think of, like, Venn diagrams, you know, or, you know, and you think about these overlapping circles and such that, you know, Dave and Michael and I have, you know, we are three very different but also very similar musicians. Each one of us has a, a very distinct sound and approach, but something about the three of us together, it's just, in, in my estimation, it was a very magical combination. And... um the the thing that I really like about it, I mean, some of the aspects that I think give the band a very identifiable sound are going to be the things that the, not only Dave's guitar tone, but his approach to the guitar, and Michael, who plays a very simple drum kit, but he uses a lot of auxiliary percussion, and he doesn't care about, quote-unquote, the drums. He cares solely about... The, the music and the band. He has a very orchestral approach to playing the music. And, they, you know, they, it, nothing about this band is, is, like, really preconceived. It's just a, it's, it's one of those things where these three individual voices that just blend very, very well. And the, the things that each person brings to the music end up, you know, it's really like the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Not to talk a little gestalt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess my final question to you to kind of summarize your trip and this tour is, when you have an album that comes out or you're playing a show, you always have a hope for the audience. What is your hope for the audience that either comes to the Green Lady to see you or buys your album and listens to your music? I mean, I love jazz, I love jazz music. Now, but... Unfortunately, I think that a lot of times jazz, you know, you were talking about, you know, some of it being very classroom and stuff. It can feel very cold. 
And I don't think any of the great jazz musicians, you mentioned some of my absolute favorites, you know, Ornette Coleman, uh, you know, Miles of all periods, you know, I don't care what he's talking about, Jerry Mulligan, Jimmy Jeffrey, Chico Hamilton, Ornette, any of these people, their music was not cold. It was very powerful, it was very emotional, and I think that that's the thing that has been enduring about it. Now, you know, this group is is not a quote-unquote straight-ahead jazz group, but it's definitely not an avant-garde band as well. It manages to kind of walk right in the middle of those two worlds with this very 2017 kind of approach as well. And I hope that what people walk away from it is that, you know, not only do they do they have a great listening experience, but they, you know, they they... they connect with material that they may have known in a very different way and that they catch the very personal aspect of this band and that they also really like walk away from it feeling that these are three musicians who love playing together hopefully passionately present this material beautiful and i have no doubt that that's going to be the way it's going to be joe thank you for catching up with me talking to me about your visit to kansas city about the album and sending it over i'm looking forward to profiling on the show Thanks so much, Joe. I really appreciate it. We hope to see you out and about. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Chicago, Kansas City, New York, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Joe for his time, his stories, and coming through this little town of ours here in KC. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.